Boa tarde a todos, sejam todos bem-vindos a mais uma live do canal do Museu Joias da Natureza. É uma felicidade e alegria quando a gente desenvolve é, as nossas lives, que são lives de conteúdo, e eu tenho sempre é, chamado pessoas incríveis da ciência. É claro que nós trabalhamos em outras áreas também, mas as ciências naturais é o nosso foco. É, eu me considero um naturalista, devido à minha formação acadêmica, e tento trabalhar várias é, áreas das ciências naturais. E o Museu Jóias da Natureza, desde 2001, ele vem se é, dedicando a esse propósito, a divulgar, difundir né, as ciências naturais para toda a sociedade. E eu gosto muito, então, é, das nossas lives, principalmente desse quadro chamado Conversando com Ciência, e que hoje, é, olha, eu vou até pedir desculpa já para todo mundo que estiver nos assistindo, hoje eu estou um pouco nervoso, estou soando um pouco até frio, porque eu estou simplesmente entrevistando é, o doutor Uwe Reimold, que é o maior cientista, é, na minha opinião, o maior cientista, um dos maiores cientistas de especialistas, é, entendedores, enfim de crateras de impacto, de estruturas de impacto no planeta. Nós temos é, é, excelentes pesquisadores, temos o, aqui no Brasil o maior de todos do Brasil, doutor, é, um grande amigo, o doutor Álvaro Crosta, e temos excelentes profissionais, a doutora, a doutora Natália, que está nos apoiando aqui na nossa live. Natália, já estou desde já te agradecendo, e em breve vamos estar tá batendo papo a doutora Natália e o doutor Álvaro sobre Araguainha, que vai ser a nossa nossa próxima live. É, então, nós temos excelentes pesquisadores no Brasil, né? É, temos o Marcos Nascimento, temos a Grace, nossa, temos tantas pessoas incríveis estudando esse campo fenomenal da, da geologia planetária, das ciências, né? Que, que são as estruturas de impacto, né? Dentro da meteorítica. Mas o doutor Uwe Reimold é, é um cara, é, eu estou realmente muito mais do que feliz, eu estou orgulhoso de, de ele ter aceitado é, bater esse papo com a gente. É, e só para quem é da área sabe a importância do doutor Uve dentro desse setor, dessa, dessa incrível área da geologia. Então, doutor Uve, eu quero, em português agora, já vou pedir desculpa, meu inglês meio arranhado, mas é, eu quero lhe agradecer muito, muito mesmo, por você ter aceito esse convite. E eu tenho certeza que essa live, esse bate-papo mais informal, vai ser demais. E a sua apresentação também, a gente vai se deliciar. É, antes de começar o, o nosso bate-papo, eu quero agradecer também a todo mundo que nos acompanha nas nossas lives, todos os nossos amigos é, que estão com a gente. Aqui no, no chat já temos o Marcelo, o Jamil, o Tony. Muito obrigado por estarem com a gente. É, já deixo suas perguntas aí no chat e também no WhatsApp. E eu queria agradecer o meu parceiro, é, que desde o ano passado está junto com o museu, e o doutor Uve e a Natália estão convidados para quando vir para São Paulo a irem visitar uma reserva ambiental maravilhosa que fica no Vale do Ribeira, que é, é do IPBio, que é o Instituto de Pesquisa da Biodiversidade, que é parceiro do Museu Jóias da Natureza desde o ano passado. Então, para o Sérgio Pompé, que é o diretor, o nosso apoiador. Obrigado pela confiança no trabalho, Sérgio. Obrigado por estar junto com a gente. Com certeza, sem você, é, tudo estaria muito mais difícil. Então, ter você do nosso lado é uma grande alegria. Bom, é, já falei bastante. Quero mais uma vez agradecer a todo mundo. Então, eu estou é, muito honrado, é, feliz de estar falando com o doutor Uwe Reimold, que... É, como eu falei, é, é, para mim é o, é o, é o Rogério Ceni é, é do São Paulo, porque eu sou São Paulino, então estou dando um, uma, um exemplo de um grande ídolo do São Paulo. Posso falar também do Raí, enfim, de vários jogadores. Mas, doutor Uve, thank you very much for your kind, é, for your é, amazing person, and please. 
before we can start this interview, this sharing, please uh, speak about Dr. Uvi. Speak about you, please, and we can start your presentation, please. Thank you. Muito obrigado, Paulo, uh, para sua gentileza e uh, introdução. I think I better switch over to English now. <laughs> um, it is a great pleasure to be here and uh, share this afternoon with everybody. Boa tarde para todos. Uh, you don't want to spend too much time talking about me, rather about <laughs> impact craters, especially in Africa. Um, I studied in Germany. I spent a long time at the University of the Witwatersrand in South Africa, which provided a great opportunity to investigate African impact structures, especially Fredefort, which was essentially on the doorstep in Johannesburg. Um, then I went back to Germany. There was a fantastic opportunity to work for the Museum for Natural History in Berlin and a very productive time with lots of administration on the side in Berlin. And uh, then I managed to retire and two weeks later, started working again in Brasilia. And uh, I was already have been in Brazil and in Brasilia for six very happy years. Um, I've been working with Alvaro Crosta of Campinas since 2001, actually on Araguinha. And uh, for the last six years, I've been working very closely with Natalia Hauser from mm -hmm. Brasilia. And uh, there is a, a bit of a team of impact friends and friends, a, a group of friends working on impact in Brazil, which has been fantastic. Wonderful. This is the most important, this uh, incredible uh, impact to friends that you made, made it in Brazil. Because you are the man for this reason. You, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Natalia, Dr. Alvaro, uh, when meet you, wonderful. Uh, it's a is a very pleasure to know you. You know you have a, a amazing work in this geology field. So congratulations, congratulations, Dr. Ovi. Thank you, Paul. So, uh, Natalia, podemos começar. Uh, vamos uh, compartilhar a apresentação do professor Dr. Ovi. Mm -hmm. Dr. Uvi, mm -hmm. you can start, please. Thank you, Paolo. We are Thank talking you. about impact structures of Africa with a strong focus on Fredefort, the largest and until just two years ago, the oldest known impact structure in the world. There is now a little one in Australia that has taken this title away from Fredefort. On this slide, we can see already the importance of impact cratering on old planetary surfaces. In the middle, an image of a section of the surface of the moon with numerous impact structures. And Southern Africa has very old crust, Earth terrestrial crust, and therefore there are several impact structures located and identified and confirmed in Southern Africa. The other two images, these collages, they represent a number of African impact structures on the left as digital elevation models and on the right side, exactly the same scenes with the digital elevation model in combination with other satellite data, Sentinel-2 satellite data of the Copernicus system of Germany, uh, indicating a lot of detail. In the upper right, we have, for example, the Busumtwi crater, which I will show later. Um, in the lower left, we have Fredefort, or actually only the central part of the Fredefort structure, which will occupy us quite a bit later on. Why is impact important? Not just to the impact cratering aficionados, but uh, 
it's really an important fundamental process that has been active since the very beginning of the evolution of the solar system. The selection of pictures from the moon on the left and then several pictures from Mariner 10 and messenger space probes from Mercury showing craters and more craters and more craters. The moon's surface is completely saturated with impact structures. It's been a fundamental planetary surface modifying process on all solid bodies in the solar system. And the gases, gas giant planets have not escaped this bombardment either. The impact cratering process has been fundamental since the beginning of accretion of planetary matter from small dust grains in the upper left to dust balls or snowballs to little meteoroids or mini planetesimals, planetary embryos and finally planets. Up here in the upper right, we are having a giant impact event, maybe a Mars-sized body hitting the Earth or the proto-Earth, as we want to call it, and the projector being totally destroyed, eventually re-accreting to form the Moon. Maybe several such impacts actually finally resulted in the formation of the moon. Impact has been important, especially large impact events at certain times have been very important for our planet. Especially in the Hadean, the earliest part of the planet evolution and the Archean era, impact's role could have been frustration of life because the planetary surface was completely disrupted and destroyed over and over again or maybe the early impact craters that were formed could have been sites to fertilize life nice and hot maybe at the edges warm and wet crater lakes or impact into oceans, shallow oceans could have been places for early primitive life, algae, or even more uh, primordial to develop. Here we have a scene from a movie of the 90s, a large asteroid of the size of Manhattan taking, well, taking care of the city of New York. Here we have 2.5 billion year old giant stromatolites in South Africa, a cyclist for comparison here, about five, six meters tall, development of life, proliferous development of life at about 2.5 billion years ago. In order to assess what impact cratering did in terms of development or frustration of the development of life on Earth, we need to get a better impact rate, which we can do in two ways. We can count craters on the surface of the moon and other planetary bodies, and then we can determine the ages of those surfaces, which gives us a rate of impact craters forming with time. Or we can do geological work, collect samples within known and confirmed impact structures on Earth, and then try to date them with our mass spectrometric methods. We know that at least in one case, impact and a major extinction event, mass extinction, took place on Earth at the time of the deposition of the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary about 66 million years ago, the end of the dinosaur era, the beginning of the mammal era on our planet. Are catastrophic impact events possible in the future on this planet? And do, will they have a role to play for the evolution or demise of our race? How can we protect ourselves against asteroids and comets? And a lot of work is being conducted by various methods, determining the rates of 
or the looking at the possible projectiles, asteroids, comets, their compositions. On the other hand, numerical modeling of impacts of hard materials and soft materials onto hard and soft materials, as an example. And then also better understanding the impact process by doing geological work on, on ground. Impact is not all bad. It can have very beneficial side effects. It can be an ore forming process, producing a lot of value. Billions of US dollars have been, or many hundred or hundreds of billions of dollars have been made from the sale of nickel and other metals out of the Sudbury impact structure in Canada. Or the gold, a little example here with a lot of gold in South, from South Africa, from the Witwatersrand Basin, is actually been obtained within the largest impact structure known on Earth, the Fredeford impact structure. Fredeford and Witwatersrand are synonymous. There are other aspects, lots of other, in, in, other possible uh, economic deposits that I could talk about in Sweden, in Mexico, and in many other countries, Canada and the US have been obtaining oil and gas out of impact structures a lot for more than 100 years. Our planet is a dangerous planet. It is not so safe to live on our planet, at least if you live around the Pacific Ocean, the Ring of Fire. We have volcanic eruptions, we have tsunami as results of earthquakes in the oceanic regime. We've got earthquakes with massive damages and huge numbers of dead. 90,000 in China in 2008, 220,000 confirmed dead and maybe another 100,000 still missing. Mount Pinatubo. An eruption in 1991 had very long-lasting environmental effects. Displacement of large local communities, destruction of houses and wide-ranging destruction of agriculture, and effects on the atmosphere. Atmospheric pollution over much of the globe and warming for a longer period of time of the atmosphere. But does impact represent a super risk? We were reminded just a few years ago in February 2013 that impacts are possible. This is what many motorists in the Ural region of Russia could see, a meteor, a fireball. And the shock wave in front of this fireball caused injuries, and huge damages, 7,000 buildings damaged, 1,500 injured, mostly by flying glass from these broken up buildings. It was a small impact event, actually a small burst of a meteor in the atmosphere, 400 to 600 kilotons of TNT explosive equivalent. The projectile was 20 meters in size. The largest impact event, Fredefort in South Africa, that took place two billion and a few million years ago, had an explosive force of 100 million megatons. That's once more million tons TNT explosive. The projectile was large, maybe 10 kilometers in size. The velocity was large too, and the amount of energy produced is unimaginable. The result, a maybe 250 kilometer diameter crater, perhaps even larger. This is an old false color Landsat image, satellite image of the central part, about 90 or 100 kilometers wide, the so-called Fredefort Dome, which represents the central uplift structure of this huge complex impact structure. We want to assess what is the risk for us of a super impact catastrophe? 
and what would be the result of such an event today or even smaller impacts of continental or maybe global destructive force. In order to do this, we need to study impact craters. Two other cases where we had impacts in recent times, in July 1994, small fragments of a disrupted comet, Shoemaker Levy 9, 150, maybe 200 meters in size only, caused huge craters in the atmosphere of planet Jupiter. These impact sites are as wide as our planet's diameter, 12,000, about 12,000 kilometers. In 2007, a small projectile, maybe just a meter or two in size, formed this tiny little crater, 14 meters in diameter, in Peru. Carancas is the place and I believe one cow was slightly or was touched by some mud that flew out of this pit. We have lots of projectiles in space, especially between Mars and Jupiter and the asteroid belt. Here we have 1,400 orbits represented as well as the orbits of the terrestrial planets, Mercury, Earth, Venus, and Mars. These potentially hazardous objects are thought to be larger than 140 meters, and this is the record of 2013. Today we have the record of 2300. These past potentially hazardous objects are coming closer than 7.5 million kilometers towards the Earth's orbit. If you could actually resolve this picture, you would see how many of these orbits are crossing the Earth orbits. Near-Earth objects, known in 2021, count about 21 or 23,000. So there are lots of objects out there. I understand that for the next 30, 50 years, we don't have to be too worried, but do we know the entire source, the entire pool of asteroids out there. And what about comets that can come from far outside of the solar system and uh, of the, the, what we normally consider the solar system and uh, suddenly surprise us with an entry into the inner solar system. Okay, what do we do when we have time for research? How do we investigate the impact process and its effects on rocks on planets? And how do we recognize the effects of impact, which we need to do in order to confirm the existence of impact structures? Our impact cratering research is an integrated discipline of geoscience and planetary science. From astrobiology to paleontology, geochemistry, etc., Everything is being done in the field of impact cratering. It's a terrestrial science, a geoscience, and it's obviously of importance for the understanding of effects of impact on planets. We have four legs on which we are walking around in impact craters or on which impact research is founded. Fieldwork. In comparison to laboratory-based analytical science. We make experiments simulating impact events into minerals and rock samples. And we carry out numerical modeling, which allows us to break down this very fast process, this ultra dynamic process into steps and investigate effects of different size projectiles, different impacting materials, different target compositions, at different velocities and so on. Here's a large shatter cone on the right side from a fragment of an impact structure from New Mexico in the US. The status quo of what we know about the terrestrial impact record, it's probably not complete, but the easy 
pickings have been done. Those structures that can be readily recognized probably all have been identified now. But we cannot give up. There are others and there are smaller ones that perhaps we can still find. There are only about 200 impact structures confirmed on Earth compared to the hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of craters which you can count on the surface of the Moon. You can see that the distribution is different. We have a dense cluster of impact structures in Australia, also in North America. There are many known impact structures, especially in Scandinavia, some in European Russia, very little in Siberia, and only two in China, and only one tiny one actually missing here, will be confirmed in writing in a publication in the next month in Mongolia. Coming to South America, we have a small number of impact structures known in South America compared to what we find in other continents. Only about a dozen. And three of those are brand new. They are highlighted with these white eggs. But I could not get them into a round shape. This is Nova Colinas. This is São Miguel de Tapuyo and São Jarao that uh, was confirmed in 2019. This question mark sits Paulo just above Sao Paulo. This is for Colonia Basin, which still needs to be confirmed. And here we have a site in Morocco called Agudal, where numerous shatter cones have been found and people have hypothesized that there is an impact crater of about one kilometer size, but this impact crater is not really in evidence. Here we have the new one, Nova Colinas on the right side. It will be presented at a conference uh, just in two weeks time, uh, the 50th Congress of the Brazilian Geological Society. It's about 5.5 kilometers in size. Several discoveries have been added to the terrestrial impact record just this year. Normally it's a rate of two to three per year, but this year has been a good one already for impact. The structure in Greenland, which was long controversially debated, was confirmed, the Avata. A new one in Australia has been presented. There is evidence for shatter cones, but uh, nothing has been published yet, but uh, we can consider it as more or less confirmed. And then there is a small crater field, about 250 structures in the USA that uh, has been established and has been proven to represent impact structures by the finding of unequivocal evidence. It will be published very shortly. So if we compare the records of South America with Africa, with the new discoveries in South America, or especially in Brazil, we now stand at 12. And in Africa, it's 20. So it looks as Africa is the winner in this quasi handball game. But this is only until we look at the respective land masses of these two continents. And South America is decisively smaller in terms of land mass than Africa. And if we calculate the equivalent, we end up with 20 to 20. Not too bad. We have two large structures in Africa, Fredefort here, Morocrang, 70 kilometers. The largest impact structure in South America known so far is Aragrinia, this one here at 40 kilometers diameter. One word, one slide about impact cratering research in South America. The action is essentially all in Brazil, especially in Campinas, Salvador, and Brasilia, most of the work on impact craters in this country is done there. Nine confirmed impact structures have been investigated for some time already, and then there is the additional, still unconfirmed target, Colonia Basin. In Argentina, there are some active people, but they have made so far unsubstantiated claims 
of multiple small impact structures in an area called the Bajada del Diablo in Chubut province. And they have even proposed a huge structure, maybe larger than Fredefort, around the Islas Malvinas. And there is no evidence for this that has been presented so far. Here in the upper right, we actually have an image, a satellite image of the Colonia Basin just outside Sao Paulo. This is the area of Vajem Granji. And uh, this area is 3.5 kilometers in diameter. It is perfectly circular, has a high rim surrounding it, nearly on all sides. It has the shape of an impact crater, but the proof is still outstanding and efforts to have a deep borehole extracted from the structure have so far not been successful. Three more examples of impact structures, or two more examples of impact structures in three pictures from Brazil. Serra da Cangalia, the inner part of the structure, the central uplift, a beautiful impact structure in Tocantins, and Arguinia here on another Tandem X TDA, a DEM digital elevation model. And a view onto part of the central uplift in this area here, the Serra da Arnica. But now it's time to go to Africa. We have the African continent with the locations of known impact structures or occurrences of impact impacted material. We have this point here, Agudal in Morocco, where we have large shatter currents. And we have a field about 100 kilometers long where yellowish glass is littering the desert floor. And it's in Egypt, but the desert is called the Libyan desert. And this is Libyan desert glass, which definitely has been formed by impact. But the impact site so far has not been revealed. We have O here, Oasis, and this is a satellite image of the Oasis structure, central uplift. And normally people give a diameter of about 11 to 15 kilometers for the structure, but we found interesting deformation right out to here, about 18 kilometers from the center of the structure, it may be larger. Buzumfi, we're going to talk about Buzumfi and I'll show you some pictures of Buzumfi, Fredefort in South Africa here, and Rota Cup, a beautiful crater in nearly pristine desert. Swaing, another young crater here, about 200,000 years old, um, same size as famous meteor crater in Arizona, but four times as old, and you can see the crater rim is not so fresh and sharp as the one for Meteor Crater that you may want to Google later for comparison. And in the center of the African continent, we only have one structure, Louisi. This is dense rainforest, very difficult to work in. And this whole area here in central, with the exception of Ghana, perhaps, this whole area has strong civil strife. It is not safe to carry out work in all these areas. There's a crater site known from Angola. I cannot tell you where it is. It's not been published, but it's probably full of landmines. So it's very difficult to work in the interior of Africa on impact stretches. The picture that I showed you already on the title slide, Tandem X digital elevation models, you can see multiple ring structures. This is Busumfi up here, which is essentially filled with the Busumfi Lake. We have um, a small structure here, Oaxis, in Algeria, Rotakam, and Fredefort in the south. And the equivalent, you can see the change of the second set of satellite data the red, green, and blue vegetation index indicates very nicely the agricultural use of the interior of the structure. It also emphasizes 
the upturned rocks in the so-called collar, the ring structure around the core of the central uplift of this huge structure. One of my favorites, Friedefort Rotterdam, and now also Aragonia. Rotterdam is about two and a half kilometers wide. It's a long walk, 11 kilometers, slightly more to go around. And that's all you can do. The outcrops are all on the edge of the crest of the crater rim. Pristine desert, the Namib desert, beautiful areas. And if you're lucky, you find an outcrop like this on one of your circumferences of the structure, impact melt rock. This impact melt rock has given us a lot of information about how impact melts, glass-like material is formed and develops and crystallizes and so on after an impact event. The Buzumpi structure in Ghana, about 10 kilometers in diameter, you can see the inner crater the crater rim, well determined over here, about 300 meters above the crater rim. We have a faint outer structure out here, and it's been discovered in the last two, three years that this is probably the edge of the remnant of fluidized ejecta, as one can find them associated with particularly Martian craters that were wet when they were flowing away outwards from the crater. We have impact generated rock sphere, so-called swayvite. It has fragments. The beige stuff is all melt, altered glass, actually. We have strong deformation within the crater rim. All the rocks are upturned in this area here. A former colleague and student of mine, Dion Brandt, for comparison. And Buzumfi is interesting for another reason. Buzumpi was drilled, and here is the drilling barge indicated with this error. It was the site of an international continental scientific drilling project, drilling project. And um, in 2005, and um, because this structure is interesting from an impact cratering point of view, but also because this crater of 10 kilometers size represents an undisturbed reservoir of paleo environmental information for the last one million years. The structure has been well dated to about one million years. And it's been possible to resolve the sedimentary record within this crater at an unprecedented scale. Oasis in Libya, long thought to be the source crater for the Libyan desert glass. Here, a nice sample that a picture that I took from the internet. Here is the reference to it. A view from the outside of the structure, actually from about here, towards the central uplift. Fascinating crater in the eastern part of the Sahara. And the evidence for soft sediment deformation, which could be, maybe, maybe not related to the impact event. And if it's related to it, the structure would be much larger, about 18 kilometers in size, than we think today. It's unfortunately not been possible to get back to Oasis since 2010 because of the still ongoing Arab Spring or the civil war in Libya. A view from a satellite, Tandem X, and here the combination with Sentinel-2 data of Luisi in the southeastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. We have a large escarpment here of about 1,000 meter difference in elevation. The structure is directly on this escarpment. And if it was possible to get there for some time, do some climbing, to some detailed geology, it would be fascinating to study the structure in three dimensions. However, to date, only this gentleman here, a good friend and colleague of ours from Vienna, Ludovic Ferrier, has visited this structure two times. And you can see that he's brought his own bodyguards along, 
his own little army, which was necessary because the Democratic Republic of Congo is still not fully democratic. He managed to obtain samples. He obtained evidence of shatter cones and shock deformation. Here's an example of one of these displays of shatter cones that he photographed and allowed us to use here. And uh, it's a definitely confirmed impact structure, but very poorly investigated so far. All the credit to Ludovic for this work that has been done so far. And then in Southern Africa, we have the largest impact structure now on Earth, Fredefort. What we normally see is only the erosional remnant of the central uplift, which is about 90 kilometers from here to here. An old Landsat image, tandem mix, digital elevation model, and the combination with Sentinel-2 satellite data. We distinguish a core, which is relatively flat, but has large outcrops of about 3 billion year old, or up to 3.3 billion year old rocks, Archean rocks. And the overlying rocks have all been upturned and form these sharp ridges on the outside. And then we go further out into the Midwaterswan Basin. Here's the structure once more, an oblique view onto the structure, which has been rotated a little bit, the core, the collar around the core, and the western part of the Witwatersrand Basin. A schematic of the Witwatersrand Basin for location, Johannesburg, the large city in South Africa is located here, just south of what is known as the Johannesburg Dome. All these domal structures are actually domes, up-domed material from the basement. All granit granitic rocks, granodiorites, and other granitic rocks, granitoid rocks on the Fredefort Dome in the center of this basin. The towns of Welcome, Clerkstow, Carltonville, Johannesburg, and in this area here, a little town called Heidelberg, are centers of gold mining, in, intense gold mining activity for or ever since 1886, when gold was discovered just south of Johannesburg. We have an intricate or very complex sequence of different rock types and I don't want to go through this and bore you to depth with these rocks, just to indicate that at the basement, at the bottom, the basement is 3 billion years or older. And at the top, the rocks are 2.2 billion years old. And the impact event took place just above the stratigraphic section. Detailed geophysics is available for this entire region. Here you can actually see the outline of the Witwatersrand Basin that I showed you in the previous picture. Down here is Welcome. In this area is Klerkstorp, Cartonville, Johannesburg. There's the Johannesburg Dome up here. And to the east, the Bushfeld Complex, a 300 by 500 kilometer size intrusion of magmatic rock, which was put down about 2060 million years ago. And the Fredefort Dome, in fact, the Fredefort impact structure, which is all this here, was formed 35 million years after that. A very complex, long lasting geological history of this region. Anything with GF, gold fields, these are the gold mining centers that I had pointed out to you. I tried my best for this presentation, and I've asked Natalia to help me with that, to turn this picture properly aligned with the edges of the slide. It was not possible. These are the regional and the local gravity anomaly maps. And you can see we have a large gravity anomaly in red over here to the south the northwest of the Fredefort Dome. Here is the dome indicated. 
And in the center, we have a sizable, but not so strong positive anomaly as well. The reason for this one is simply explained because there are rocks from deep down in the crust that have been brought closer to the surface. They are denser material than what we normally find in the upper layer of the crust. And this is responsible for this high density contrast with the surrounding area. This one up here has been interpreted for many, many years, several decades, as a result of a large magmatic intrusion. Why? Because there actually is a little intrusion here, but it is small. It is only about three kilometers wide, and this area from here to here is about 25 kilometers. This is a deep part of the Witwatersrand Basin that is filled with heavy rocks, dolomite, carbonates with quite high density compared to the other rocks, densities of the other rocks in the region. The geology, again, I can take you through the whole stratigraphy, but I don't want to do this. Just to tell you, on a traverse across from lower right to upper left, we have 3.4 billion year old mafic and ultramafic rocks, which is probably oceanic crust of Archean age. We have the granitoid basement, which forms the floor to the overlying so-called supercrustal or upper middle and upper crustal rocks, indicated in different colors. And we end up with those 2.2 to 2.5 billion year old carbonates in here in this area. We have a long lasting pre-impact geological history, 3.4, to about 2.0, okay? And 2.0 is indicated with these black lines because these are all intrusions, dikes of impact melted material, which have the name Fredeford Granophyre, and this is one of those intriguing rocks that were formed upon impact. Okay. It's been a long detective's work to prove that this huge structure, this old structure, this two billion year old impact structure was formed by impact. The problematics, we have several metamorphic, several changes to the rocks that took place over about a, mil a billion years prior to the impact. Strong metamorphism at 3.1 billion years, the intrusion of the Bushveld complex, which caused heating of the entire region, including the region of the Fredeford Dome. We had the impact with associated metamorphic changes of the rocks, especially temperature related changes and the Bushveld complex metamorphism lasted out this impact event and continued afterwards. And we are now two billion years later and trying to decipher what was the effect of the impact event into this already complicated old geological terrain. It's taken from 1868 until the mid 1990s, 1994, 1995, 96, that this evidence was put together to make a conclusive story that allowed the geoscience community globally to accept that Fredeford is an impact structure and not the result of some kind of internally generated geological process. The evidence, shatter cones, high pressure, minerals, shock micro deformation features, what we call shock metamorphism. The fact that the impact melt rock contains a meteoritic component from the projectile and a unique massive occurrence of pseudotacolytic fracture, another melt rock type that I will show you now. Shatter cones from Fredeford, 
This one is somewhere in a museum. This one is still exposed, but under great threat to be vandalized within a World Heritage Area. And this beautiful set of shatter coats, sub-horizontally arranged, has been destroyed. We were there half an hour before this happened because the second group with their bus came half an hour later and they found that somebody had destroyed this opera. Geo-vandalism, a terrible thing. These pseudo-tachylitic branches at the decameter scale, tens of meters exposed in various pedreras and quarries, two University of the Midwestern students for scale, and you can see how these rocks have been melted, how they have been rounded, probably both by mechanical action, abrasion between these blocks, and thermal abrasion as well. We have shock metamorphism, and it took a long time to prove that these features, which are not typical as we would normally see them when they are fresh, are actually metamorphosed planar deformation features in quartz from Fredefort. With the transmission electron microscope, it was revealed that any of these features represents what is known as Brazil twins. And Brazil twins in Archean granites do not form by any other process but impact metamorphism. You need about 100 kilobars of pressures to produce these twins, 10 gigapascals. The Fredeford granophyre, which is impact melt rock and revealed through isotopic methods the presence of 0.5% of a meteoritic component at the limit of what can be determined, for example, with platinum group elements today with our advanced analytical instrumentations. Here we have a beautiful zircon crystal about 0.1 millimeter in size or 0.2 millimeters in size with two arrays of shock-induced twin structures. The structure is dated. I'm not taking you through this complicated diagram here, but the impact age given by a number of zircon crystals from this sample and from several other samples gave an age of 2 billion and 23 million years of age. Another question that has fertilized debate and discussion for a long time, because everybody wants his impact structure to be the largest one in the world. How large is the Fredeford impact structure? And we can compare, for example, how far shatter counts occur within the impact structure. And we have shatter counts along 60 kilometers from the center of the structure. If you compare this with Sudbury, we get a size for the entire structure of about 250 kilometers. We can do the same thing with the second bracture type, the pseudotachylitic bracture. I explain a little bit about them later, maybe in five minutes or so. Then we got the gravity modeling that was done already in 1998. This is a traverse or a schematic through the impact structure. Here's the Friedhofer Dome, the central uplift, the outer basin in the northwest, the shallower basin in the southeast, and then the outer part of the Witwatersrand Basin over here. For example, the town of Klerksdorp over here. And I've told you that at Klerksdorp they are mining gold. So this is still within the impact structure. The Witwatersrand Basin ranges from here to here. And we've got a gravity model that gave us these sequences of rocks from the surface deep into the crust. And this is actually the Earth's mantle here. Or oh, here we get into the Earth's mantle at about 40 kilometers depth. 
It's a model, but it is consistent with the impact structure being 250 kilometers wide, maybe even 300, but we are conservative. Okay, the Fredefort Dome, the central uplift, is 90 kilometers wide and is only the central part of a much larger impact structure, 250 kilometers complex impact structure. Erosion since its formation two billion years ago has removed about five to ten kilometers of the structure. That's why I put the erosion depths where we are looking at right now in the field about here. The entire crater fill is gone. The impact breaches and the overlying impact melt rock sheet, it's gone. But we still have the granophires that are injections of this sheet into the crater floor. What we see today is only the root zone, zona de raices of the central uplift. And here we have a perfectly formed, about 100 kilometer wide impact structure, the way Fredefort must have looked two billion years ago. This is one of the large complex craters on the lunar surface. Don't worry, I'm not reading this out. A lot has been done, a lot of different workers have been involved and a lot of MSc and PhD students have contributed all the hard work. There are two main problems that are still being investigated, or three maybe. Here's another one. The structure, the geological structure of the core and the collar of the dome are still being unraveled. The origin of the two different types of melt rocks, the Fredefort granophyre and the pseudotachylitic branches, is still subject to ongoing work. And in both cases, it's controversial. There are different processes that have been proposed for the formation of both these melt rocks. Numerical modeling has been done. The structure has been, or the impact process has been simulated. The shock pressure, the pressure and temperature distribution after the impact in the rocks that were impacted has been investigated. This is the result, don't worry about it. This is much easier to understand. The rocks from the center of the structure, we have a satellite image overlaid by this bullseye picture. The rocks from the central part of the core of the Fredefort Dome have been deformed by 300 kilobar pressures and associated very high temperatures. Further out, the effects, the deformation effects in the minerals indicate half that kind of pressure. And further out, we have much less deformation. All this is central uplift. And further out in the Witwatersrand Basin, the largest area of this impact structure, we do not have diagnostic shock metamorphic effects that would tell us there's still shock metamorphism taking place. If you look at the distribution of temperature, the same thing. These rocks have been stressed by 1000 degrees centigrade post impact temperature on top of the 500 or 600 that they had already when they were in the mid crust at a depth of 20 to 25 kilometers and 700, 500 and 300 in the outer part of the Wildwatersund Basin. We have, okay, this little vein, which was melt, it is totally recrystallized, but I want to show you the Little vein was produced by impact. This is maybe a millimeter across, but the grains of quartz and feldspar of hornblende, another mineral, and maybe here again, amphibole as well, they don't show anything. They look as they looked 2.023 billion years ago before the impact, but the impact effect is here and it probably was a glassy phase that has completely recrystallized since. 
The pseudo-tacolytic bracteus, I showed you the quarry picture. They have been discussed either as a result of cisalamento, shearing or friction melting. When you rub your hands together, they get warm. If you rub too much, they get hot. And if this happens between two blocks of rocks, they may even melt. But they will not melt at a 50 or 100 or kilometer scale. Combination of shock pressure and decompression and, and shearing, intrusion of impact melt. There are indeed people around that claim that these things all represent intruded impact melt, intruded by seven kilometers from the original crater floor. Shock compression melting and decompression melting are both possibilities. Here's another big quarry of these fantastic bracteus. And these fantastic bracteus are one of the reasons why the freighter for dome in part has been declared a World Heritage Site. We have multiple pseudotacolytic bracteus in the Witwatersrand Basin here. There are three generations, yellow, green, and black. And here's some of this gold rich ore directly associated with this deformation zone. I just want to show you, I prefer to believe that these melts were formed locally. If you analyze one of these little veinlets, here 0.5 centimeters, which is a thin section to study under geologist's microscope. Here we can analyze with the electron microprobe the composition of the feldspar, the quartz, and other minerals along this vein. And in the vein, we get melts of the same compositions. Here we have quartz. The composition of the melt is quartz, silica. Here we have a feldspar. The composition is a potassium-rich feldspar, and so on. This material, I believe, has been formed locally. Okay, we do this a little faster. Evidence for shock compression melting, we have high pressure silica polymorphs, coesite and stishovite, the same composition as quartz, SiO2, in thin, less than two millimeter wide veinlets of this material. They indicate pressures of 30 and maybe 50 gigapascals required to form in, in the outermost part of the Earth's crust. The conclusions, there are two types of impact generated melt rock in the Fredefort Dome that represent formations from different processes. They are impact melt rock and in all likelihood locally produced melt. We have a lot of melt in Araguinha in Brazil as well. And the question is whether all of these melts represent impact melt rock or maybe some represent, represent pseudotaclytic bracteus as well. Ongoing research at the moment. The impact event two billion years ago has had strong effects on the gold deposit of the Witwatersrand that existed already for about a billion years prior to impact. The rocks that were impacted were laid down in sheets of sediment of a much larger area. From Botswana in the northwest to the central part of South Africa in the south. From far out here to the southeast in the center of South Africa. There in the northwest and in the southeast, and wherever else they were, they have been eroded away over these two billion years since the impact event. But they are still here in the area of the impact structure. And they have so much gold that we have this gold mining industry that has provided the treasury for South Africa for the last 120 years. What the impact did, it produced the basin structure with the central uplift in the center. I'll do this quite quickly and quite simply. And this basin 
preserve the rocks underneath, especially this yellow layer, layer, which has been eroded away to the northwest and to the southeast. But in the Witwatersrand area, it still exists and it maintained and preserved the gold. So the gold was there already for a billion years before the impact. But when the hot rock of the central uplift came up to the surface of the earth, it was overlain by a thick, kilometer thick sheet of impact melt, which had temperatures of maybe 1500 or 2000 degrees upon formation. The fluids in these rocks from the upper part of the crust all migrated outward. They didn't like the heat in the central part of the impact structure. And these fluids were hot as well. In this area, where gold mining is taking place, I told you 300 degrees centigrade was the metamorphism. The fluids also had 300 degrees centigrade temperatures. And that is enough to dissolve a lot of gold from the pre-existing sedimentary gold that was already there. And this secondary gold was deposited together in these areas where the pressure and temperature were less in the uppermost crust, lower temperature far away from this hot body in the center. And these are the rocks that are preserved and are mined today. The last part of this presentation deals with Fredefort being a World Heritage Site. I mentioned it already two or three times. It was already declared on the 14th of July 2005, to great excitement of the South African people, and especially the people who were living in this central part of the structure. They thought lots of jobs, lots of tourists, lots of money for an area that historically has been underemployed. It is estimated that unemployment in this region is probably 60 to 70 percent. That is a lot of people. This northwestern part and several outliers here in the center and further out have been declared a World Heritage Area. It was selected for its intriguing history. We had the Anglo-Boer War. Before that, we had settlements by black people. We had apartheid affecting this area very much, at least as much as the rest of South Africa. We have gold mining surrounding it, and we already have ecotourism in this area and lots of archaeology. It was hoped that geotourism would extend beyond the World Heritage Area and that maybe a wider area could be declared a geopark and attract even more, perhaps even more, South African tourists. But there were problems. We have to the north of this big river, a province, and to the south of this river, a second one. So there were two authorities fighting for supremacy. There are seven district councils or municipalities that wanted their part of the money from the government. And local landowner associations that were worried that they could not build the next silo without having to get permission from the United Nations. Okay. What are the assets? Beautiful landscapes, intriguing geology that I've presented to you. 3.5 billion year of geological evolution. There are not many areas in this world of this size where we can have, where we can talk about this kind of multi-stage geological evolution. Fantastic landscapes, archaeology, petroglyphs on impact melt rock, early settlements of black people, a fantastic biodiversity with proteas in certain valleys in the structure, an existing adventure tourism already, 
an international airport only 120 kilometers away from the structure and another world heritage site just to the northeast of Johannesburg, just at the edge of the Freda Fort Witwatersrand infrastructure. And that together with the international recognition as a World Heritage Site was considered the future of this currently deprived and depraved area. We have a visitor center because development took place. Some roads were tarred and this fantastic visitor center was paid and built and collapsed before it opened up. We were in there in 2008 with 110 people from this conference, the Large Meteorite Impacts and Planetary Evolution 4 conference. We were there and we inaugurated this building and a large collection from international contributors of rocks and other exhibits was brought in. And now it is a collapsing and totally abandoned ruin. From 2005 till 2021, mismanagement of the Freedom Fort World Heritage Site by national government. And the UNESCO has seemingly accepted this. The structure was just re-evaluated by UNESCO a couple of months ago. This is the status, it is very sad, especially for the people who live in this area. But it's bad form to end the talk on a very negative note. So I want to say something positive. Here's an area of the Fredeford mountain land which shows you the potential that this area has. And this once more, the geology, a section of the one in a million geological map of South Africa, for, centered on the Fredeford structure, showing you this fantastic natural laboratory and tourism environment that it boasts. I thank you for your attention. If there's anybody interested in more comprehensive information on the world's confirmed impact structures, there is an atlas on the 200 known impact structures today based on Tandemix Atlas imagery for all these structures, some of which I could show you from Africa and also South America and uh, from Asia, etc. as well. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Hello, Dr. Nuvi, Natalia. Hello. W wonderful presentation. Is amazing. And uh, na, na, now, Dr. Uvi, we have some question, some sure. question uh, from chat and from WhatsApp too, okay? Sure. Uh, Natalia. Yes. Eu, um, algumas eu vou fazer em português para você fazer para ele ah. e algumas eu faço em inglês, tá bom? Ah, eu tenho, eu não consigo ver aqui o chat. Tá, eu, vou, eu vou fazer algum, algumas em inglês no, do chat e algumas em português do WhatsApp, tá bom? Tá bom, mas posso me passar, eu posso passar para okay. ele. Doutor Uvi, uh, one question. Um, how deep was the Vredefort crater? And how high was the central dome? Is the first question, please. When the initial crater formed, the so-called transient crater, it lasts maybe for a minute before it's totally collapsed. It was probably in the order of 100 kilometers deep. And you can say it reached deep into the Earth's mantle. Yes, it displaced material, but all this material came back up. And, wow. what, we see, and what we see today at the surface is material which is from roughly 25 kilometers deep down in the target area. How high the central uplift was oversteepened, I do not know. But I would guess it was high. <laughs> so I have no idea. Probably okay. tens of kilometers. Wow. That when these rocks came up by tens of kilometers 
from the ultimate depths where they were, they would be totally deformed. But what we see in the field are deformations which were already there prior to the impact, something that was Im imposed onto the rocks after the impact, and they don't have this detailed structure of deformation that we would want to see. We have the bracteous, I showed you, the pseudotachylytic bracteous that are okay. in every outcrop. That is one manifestation of impact deformation. And that's it. The rocks are fractured, but they are also thermally annealed again, restored again to a degree. So we do not see this intricate destruction that you would expect for such a huge catastrophe. One enigma. Wonderful. And the second, the, the second question is, what was the composition and the orange of the impacted body, if you know? I don't know. <laughs> okay. I cannot tell you whether it was an asteroid or whether it was a comet. Ah, yeah? We have, we have evidence for enriched, highly siderophile elements. These are particularly the platinum group elements, osmium, uranium, platinum, rhodium, rutinium. I've forgotten one. Doesn't matter. Maybe. Palladium. Palladium. <laughs> Maybe a uh, siderite, meteorite. What do you think? It's not impossible. It could have been an iron. It could have been a chondritic. If you don't know whether it's a, but it probably wasn't an achondrite because we do have this enrichment. It is, this projectile was totally diluted, but we still have in the remnants of the melt rock or the remnants of the melt injections into the crater floor deep crater flow is 0.5 percent of osmium which is very little above the background but because the background in this case is actually very low we could still determine it okay professor natalia has tried rhenium osmium determination and identification of the projectile in the case of Aragonia. she couldn't do this we don't know why <laughs> Maybe it was an achondrite that would not have had this amount of highly siderophile material. Maybe it is so diluted, or maybe we don't have the actual rock that would have contained this in evidence left, because Arguina is eroded as well. Okay. But she should talk about this, not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the other question is, the, did the native people on the region, not in the Circle Mountain Ranges, did they have any legends or myths about the formation? What do you think about this? Have some legends of this big crater? That's a very interesting question, and it's probably something that a lot of archaeologists have been thinking about in South Africa. But I'm not aware of any legends. The first people moved into the region in the 14th century, around 1350, 1400. There were people that came from the area of Zimbabwe to the north and from Botswana in the northwest. By then, the landscape probably was very similar to what it is now. In another 700 years, not much erosion takes place on a regional scale. So they saw what we saw. Um, the next wave of immigrants into this area was about 1850, 1860, when the white people came and largely displaced the actual landowners, the black people. They don't have any historical recollections either that deal with the actual structure. They talk about holes in the ground further to the north where the carbonates have collapsed and formed sinkholes. But that's all. And we've researched the history quite a bit with the help of people from museums and with the help of people from 
the other World Heritage Area to the northeast, the cradle of humankind. And uh, nothing has really been produced. Okay. Doruv, we have more questions about, about Vredefort. Um, the first one is the shatter cones that uh, that you find. Uh, which kind of rock type of rock you find these shatter cones? Just one type, yeah. or you can find the shatter cones in more than one type of rock. It's always been said that the finer grained the rock is, like a a silt, uh, silt. Mm. Folelio or something Folelio. like that? Folelio. 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 Uh, shale uh, is the shale. Yeah, Argelio, something like that. Silchita. Mm. Silchita, okay. Or fine grained sandstone, an arenite, arenito. Uh, okay. Uh, the cones are more prominently formed, and this is true, but they also form in other rocks, and we have coarse granites in Fredefort that contain shatter cones, but they are more difficult to see. You need to find the right light, the right time of the day with the sun at the right angle to actually see them. Okay. So fine-grained rocks would be where you start looking for shatter cones. Okay, amazing. Uh, Dr. Ruvi, uh, the famous Komatiiti rocks uh, in the South Africa is the type of locality from the Komatiiti, from Komati River. Um, this type of rock is affected by the the heat, by the shock of the Vredefort? Anything would be affected, any rock type would be affected by such an impact event. Uh, the shock pre pressure and the associated temperature have to be high enough to leave a lasting effect on the minerals in Komatiite, which would be olivine, pyroxene, Olivine is a good mineral to shock deform. Pyroxene does not really show nice effects at the microscopic scale. We have a bit of komatiite actually in Fredefort. In the southeast, where I showed you, there were 3.4 billion year old rocks. There is a little bit of komatiite, komatiitic basalt, and peridotite. Uh, very similar to the type locality in the Barberton mountain land about 400 kilometers to the east from Fredefort and possibly representing similar oceanic crust of that time. Yes, very interesting. Um, we have other question about Vredefort. Um, what do you think about the Vredefort uh, when you make some relationship with the evolution, the biological evolution in this time, uh, from okay, the... What was there at two billion years ago? There were carbonate rocks, there was a shallow sea, the so-called Transvaal Sea. There were, there were stromatolites. Okay. Very similar to what you find today in places like Sharks Bay in Western Australia. Okay. In the north of Perth. Um, and yes, we would have suffered. Some of them would probably have been burned. The sea would have been evaporized. But these things are resistant. They come back. You need a little bit to seed and the algae are back. The microbes are back. So there was no mass extinction. There was regional extinction for a while. But then after I don't know how much, 50, 100,000 years, probably there would have been niches with life again. Not in the inner crater. It would have been still hot, maybe hot for a million of years, too hot to favor any development of life. Yeah? Yes. Wow. How many times? Probably a million, of, million years or so. <laughs> There's wow. been detailed modeling done for how long the melt sheet in Sudbury, which is only a little smaller, than Trader Ford. And uh, maybe a similar amount of melt produced actually. Depends on the size of the projector, the velocity of the projector, the angle of impact, and so on. But uh, 
it was modeled that the rocks at Sudbury were still hot a million years after the impact. Extraordinary. Um, we have other question about the gold deposits in Vredefort. Uh, the gold elements already exist in the place and the, the Vredefort uh, forming these deposits. You can explain a little bit about this uh, yes. formation, about this gold, because it's two very famous gold deposits and uh, have directly the relationship with the Vredefort. Yeah. I think it is a very good uh, information for a lot of people that... Please. The Vredefort is one of the great gold provinces in the world. Something like 50,000 tons of gold have been mined out of the Vredefort. Wow. The high time of gold mining was between the 70s and uh, the late 90s. When afterwards it went down, the gold price was not so high as it used to be. Uh, the wages, the salaries became higher in South Africa. And uh, so the mining industry suffered. But the way the gold price is today, $1,500, $1,600 per ounce of gold, they're making a profit again yeah. and they're producing again. Um, but the gold was deposited about 2,800, 2,900 million years ago, which is nearly a billion years before the impact event. The gold was deported, deposited into the existing Witwatersrand Basin, which I told you was much larger than what we see today by rivers. It came down from a, what people call hinterland, the area behind the basin where it was eroded and washed down with big streams into a shallow sea, the Witwatersrand Sea, about 2.8, 2.9 billion years ago. And it was deposited. And it was deposited with organic material as well. That's why uranium was mined extensively in South Africa as well. Um, all this gold partially redeposited during later geological overprint. The gold was rounded. You have this, what they call buckshot gold. If you shoot buckshot with a gun, the grains are all rounded. And this is the form of much of the gold and much of the pyrite, the iron sulfide that was deposited together with it. And then you have this later overprint, which has been constrained to just about the time of the impact event. Shortly after the impact event, gold was remobilized by solution and redeposited on the outside or in fractures of the gold that was already there, of the iron sulfide that was already there. So we have a two-stage evolution of the Witwatersrand gold deposit. Wonderful. Uh, but not uh, we have uranium associated with gold, no? That's correct. Okay. There's a huge amount of the mineral uraninite, also known as pitch blend, within the Witwatersrand rocks. And it's been mined for a long time. Uh, the country, South Africa itself, was also putting its money towards nuclear power. And so there's a huge stockpile of mined uranium. But obviously the market has changed dramatically globally. Okay. Uh, Natalia, now I want to... Eu vou fazer em português algumas perguntas, até para que as pessoas também é, entendam mais um pouco, falar um pouco mais em português com você, e aí você faz a tradução... Por favor, é, é, vamos lá. É, são questões, é, na verdade, sobre crateras, mas não todas relacionadas à Vrede Forte. Na verdade, agora quase nenhuma à Vrede Forte. É, a primeira, é, doutor Uvi, é, o pessoal queria saber se o vidro da Líbia, de Libyan Glass, está é, associado ou estaria associado a alguma cratera da África é, se o, né, o campo de dispersão, né, que a gente chama, né, a área de dispersão desses tectitos ou desses 
impactido se, se estaria ligado a alguma cratera africana, como o Oasis, que você mostrou, ou se alguma outra cratera fora da África. Primeira questão é essa, por favor. Isso aqui? Isso aqui? Eu quero entrar em português? Ô, ele fala em português, pô, isso aí é brincadeira. Pô, é brincadeira, o doutor Rubens fala em português. Você gosta de português? Aqui. <risos> Vamos lá, é que tem muita gente que fala em português aqui no Brasil, mas tá bom. <risos> Temos duas crateras de impacto, estruturas de impacto na Líbia, no leste de Líbia. BP, Sim. de tamanho 2,5 km e o Oasis, tamanho 11 a 18 km. Okay. Now, temos idades para estes duas crateras. Now, temos material para, da, para obter para geocronologia. Mm. Idade do LDG, Libyan Desert Glass, okay. e uh, BEM limitado, com 28 milhões de anos. Mas, now, temos uma estrutura que coival do mesmo ano, do mesmo idade. Então é um mistério. Is a mystery for for now. Is a mystery to to find this crater associated with the uh, Libyan glass. Is correct. Temos uh, interessantes rochas, rocha arenito com feições de choque. Deformações de choque em quartzo e um roja com silício cabide, muito denso material, com um, evidência de isotopos esta vez. Ok. E, possivelmente, e o original de um cometa. Na mesma área, na área de LDG. E uma mistério. Is this the source rock or the deeply eroded area that was impacted? Was it an air burst, an explosion of a comet or an asteroid in the atmosphere that caused the melting of desert sand? We do not know. But... These ideas are being debated. Então, então, poderia ser um airburst que fundiu a areia e formou os vidros é, de os vidros de impacto seria do o, 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 muito interessante. Então, esses vidros da Líbia poderia ser formado dessa desse tipo de formação interessante. É, Dr. Uvi, é, similar with the tectites of Indochinite that we don't, don't know the, the crater <coughs> is the same thing? What do you think? The Libyan desert glass is not tectite material. It is impact glass. Okay. Uh, they have different mineralogical uh, characteristics. But you're right. There is no source crater known today for the huge field of endochinites, muonong tectites, and so on. We do not know where they are from. People looked at various lakes in Cambodia, in Laos. They looked at uh, southern China, but so far, no source. Okay. Uh, vamos para outra questão. É, Natália, uhum. é, tem uma questão aqui que eu gostaria de... Estão perguntando se toda cratera de impacto é, pode gerar os ejectas. Se, todo, se toda cratera você acha ejecta ou não. Depende do, do, da força de impacto. É, uhum. Essa é uma outra pergunta. Em, em, em português, não. Não, não, não. Inglês, inglês. 
Todos os impactos producem ejectas. Uh, small craters sin estratos de ejectas. Grandes crateras muito material e ejetada e tem um, layers. Co coberturas com ejectas de grande espessura. Ok. Mas erosão para vento, gelo e água, particularmente, e importante no todo planeta, todo planeta. Everywhere we have erosion, and unless the structure is very fresh, we may not preserve ejecta. In Buzumtwi, we have areas with ejecta, but only about 15 meters thick. Maximum, they have been drilled, we know, in certain areas, and everything else has been eroded. Okay. Um, oh, wonder, uh, other question from chat. Uh, the Vrede Fort impact was responsible for any type of extension no. that you recognize, of course. Okay. Well, as I said before, maybe algae were made extinct on a regional or maybe even continental, subcontinental scale. We don't know how large the continental fragment that was impacted at the time and then later was aggregated with the rest of Africa actually was. Um, but there was no life beyond the primitive microbial and algal life at the time. Uh, yes. Agree. In this time, just the stromatolites. Stromatolites. Uh, I had mentioned yeah. there are some outliers of the World Heritage Area, and one of them specifically shows or preserves an area with algal mats and small stromatolytic structures to indicate what the situation was in terms of life at the time of impact. Okay. And uh, Dr. Uwe, about uh, Agudau shatter cone, the shatter cones from Agudau is uh, coming from the Agudau crater. I, I don't understand when you talk about this uh, okay. is other place. Okay, Agudau is a small village in the high Atlas Mountains of Morocco. Yes, it's, it's northeast, southwest, striking mountainous area. And um, there are some hills south of the village that are maybe 100, 150 meters high, but the valleys in between are quite steep. And there's a little hill that is full of shattercones. And on the other side of one of these valleys is a small area of two by two meters and another one of five by five meters with shattercones. There is no crater structure in evidence. It has been mapped that the shatter cones actually occur, individual ones have been recognized over a somewhat larger area, and it's been suggested that it is a quite deeply eroded remnant of a crater structure. The second idea that some people prefer is that it represents a small fragment of a crater structure that was moved by tectonic forces, by mountain building processes from the site of the or from the original site of the impact structure and incorporated into this deformed tectonic jumble of blocks, of large blocks the size of hundreds of meters, maybe kilometers. So but the, the structure is not in evidence, and it's not in evidence in geophysical data either. So uh, don't have, the shatter cones don't have any relationship with the the iron meteorite from uh, Agodau. Is a cedar? No, no, no. This iron meteorite fell much, much later. It's been suggested that the impact that formed the shatter cones was maybe. Jurassic, in Jurassic times, or the limestone, you know, the meteorite that was found in this area 
And in the course of search for this meteorite, some Russian colleagues actually stumbled on these shatterkans, fell much more in recent times. I do not recall right now what the actual age for the meteorite fall is. There are some cosmogenic nuclei results, some exposure age, maybe 200,000 years or 150,000 years, I don't know. The meteorite is quite fresh. If it had been lying there and weathered away over such a long time that it takes to remove a crater of maybe kilometer size, there would no, be no, no more meteorite lying around. It would just be a little bit of rust or completely washed away. Okay. Um, the shatter cone from Agudov in Limestone, you know? Limestone. The rock, it, you know? It's, it's a Marley limestone. It Marley has some, Marley some limestone, clay right. minerals in it, but okay. it's, uh, it's kind of a limestone, yeah. Um, let's go. We have another question. Um, Natália, eu vou fazer em português para você essa. A, 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 Dr. Uve, há relatos de, ou pesquisas de meteoritos contendo elementos radioativos relacionados aos impactos? Is there any receipt of meteorites with radioactive elements? Do you want to answer? No, I can answer. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a cosmochemist, but yes. <laughs> Meteorites have uranium. Meteorites have been dated, for example, by application of the geochronological uranium lead, uranio shombo technique. Okay. So there are radioactive elements in meteorites. Samarium, neodymium is another pair of radio radiogenic and stable parent and daughter isotopes, and so on. Ok. É, Natália, é, bom, mais uma, tem algumas outras perguntas, vamos ver se a gente consegue terminar todas as perguntas, tem várias. É, uma outra pergunta, acho bem interessante, em relação é, se o doutor Uve saberia me dizer que essa relação dos chatercones é, do Marrocos, de Agudal, seria parecido com a questão das brechas de impacto de Álamo, nos Estados Unidos, que até hoje não se achou a cratera de Álamo, mas se sabe que são brechas de impacto. Se o doutor Uve conhece alguma coisa sobre isso? Deve conhecer, com certeza. Brechas de impacto na água da Álamo? Não, não, não. Se há uma relação, por exemplo, mas eles não sabem a origem do crater, em Álamo, em Unity State, porque eles encontram o impacto na rock, ou as brechas, Unlike in Agudal, you found the shatter cone, but you don't found the, the crater. Okay. The Alamo breach is also not directly related to an impact crater. And again, it is thought that tectonic movements in the course of one of the orogenies that formed the Rocky Mountains of North America, that a block, a part of the impact crater was actually preserved because it was maybe down faulted to a deeper level that was not eroded okay. or, or that it was moved laterally away from the impact site and the rest of the impact site was destroyed by erosion. It's another case. Uh, where the it, same it process as in Agudal could perhaps apply. Well, in New Mexico, the shuttle company yeah. shop. Um, Natalia just reminds me that uh, I sh the large shatter cone from New Mexico that I showed you. I see. It was one slide with large shatter cones. They actually are the size of about a meter and a half or so long. That's another case where shatter cones exist very close to the city of Santa Fe, but not in a crater. And maybe it's the same process again. Uh, the Laramide orogeny at the time, was it 30 million years ago about, could have moved a block away from an impact crater. Very interesting. Muito interessante, muito interessante. Dr. Uwe, why the, this uh, Alamo brecha that uh, we can prove that is impact rock, uh, why the Alamo you 
um, don't find in the in the uh, uh, North American impact craters list, like the pesk pesk mm -hmm. from Canada have a very mm -hmm. big and large uh, site website about the impact craters. Why the Alamo? Uh, they don't put the name Alamo. It's not a crater. It's a, a crater database. You're thinking about the PASSC database, the Earth Impact Database. It does not have uh, other impact related deposits like the Archean impact layers from Western Australia, from the Barberton Mountain Land in South Africa are not in this list either. Okay. Now the I showed you on the last uh, slide of the presentation does have some text about some deposits. And yes. the story part refers to the Achaean straw layers as well. But if you if you give a look uh, in Africa, craters they uh, put Agudau. So I know, I know. And I was and I was a co-author of the paper that started talking about the Agudal crater in meteoritics and planetary science. But we debated it ever since. I do not believe that if we use erosion rates to determine what could have been eroded, uh, that it allows us to draw circles on the surface of the earth where craters are supposed to have been. Okay. I okay. think we need to be very careful what we put into databases. <laughs> yeah. But if you know, uh, I think about some uh, Colonia. You put in Colonia in the list, but you no. don't have the confirmation. You're, you agree with I me? I don't put Colonia in the list. No, but no, you no, you, no, you, no, you, but you, you but find it. I am careful and I'm saying that no definite evidence for impact shock metamorphism has been produced for Colonia. And therefore, it should not be con considered a confirmed impact crater. Yes. It is a possible impact possible. crater. In your opinion, what do you think about this? I think it's possible. possible. <laughs> very well and very well possible. But we do need to have this final evidence before we can call it confirmed. And okay. the three papers that talk about shock metamorphism in Colonia in the literature do not present sufficient evidence. Okay, yeah, is high pressure polymorphs, similar material. Shock okay. zerk should all be there if it is an impact structure. You are present for us the some new impact craters like Nova Colinas and Douglas Streetfield and or a banda from Australia. And I I I know more one new confirmed crater that you know uh, I think is a uh, Pantasma craters in Nicaragua. What do you think? This is confirming okay. the crater. Let's, let's start. Let's start with my list, okay? And then we go to Pantasma. Hiawatha in Greenland was. I was not a friend of Hiawatha, but they have this year produced new evidence of shock metamorphism from within this crater or within this structure. Okay. <laughs> Previously, it was only loose sediment from outside. So now I have to admit. They were right. <laughs> okay, but they also knew this, had this evidence apparently for years. Why didn't they publish it? They should have had a discovery paper with the evidence and not publish things like a salami in slices. Okay, Yavata. Orabanda <coughs> has not been scientifically published. Pictures of shed accounts from Orabanda have been on the internet. I can I give a look. I give a look. Shed accounts on the internet and say they are from a new structure anywhere. The internet is not a reference of safe and scientifically produced material. 
Therefore, I said Aura Banda is probably an impact structure, but we're waiting for the final publication. Okay. And now that this material has been looked at by proper impact cratering specialists in Australia, and there is other work being done at the moment on oh, with mineralogical methods, state of the art at Curtin University in Perth. And I think within the next 10 months, we'll probably have the proper discovery paper for Aurobanda. Okay. Our Colinas. In two weeks, there will be a talk at the 50th Congress of the SPG, Sociedade Brasiliense de Geologia. And uh, we will present the evidence of shock metamorphism. Our group, Natalia, Alvaro Crosta, people overseas, myself, we are currently preparing the manuscript to be submitted with all this evidence. And then it will be finally accepted and introduced into the Earth Impact Database if somebody takes over the Earth Impact Database. It has not been curated since 2016. So five years of new evidence has not been included in this database. Pantasma. Okay, there's some evidence <laughs> in terms of impact and there are some people who are skeptical. I told you I'm conservative, I'm skeptical too. <laughs> why, 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 why Dr. Ruvi? Because uh, I, I know that Pierre that is, is steady. I know, I know the authors of this paper, which recently came out in Meteoritics and Planetary Science. Christian Kruber is, one, is probably my best friend. And uh, yes, it looks as if it could be an impact crater, but there are some problems, some geological problems. Okay. I think further work needs to be done on it to convince me and maybe another three or four people. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ruvi, in, um, I received it from the Pierre one uh, impact brescia from Pantasma for our music collection. And uh, I also have the Tectite from Possible. We have a, a relationship, relationship with this Pantasma crater is the Belizite from Belize. I already have one sample, a very hard material, uh, and I already have one sample in the music collection. So yeah. I think is a is a, a is possible is a impact crater. I don't know. Well, in your opinion, why you don't think so about this? I think we should uh, not discuss this point. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and Douglas, Douglas is okay. Douglas is true fuel. Is okay. I'm a little compromised to talk about Douglas. There has been a early publication about it in scientific reports or something like that. Scientific advances. There's a second paper that is currently under review, and that causes a compromise for me because I'm dealing with this and I should not talk about it. Okay, no but, problem. But I have heard the evidence two years ago in October 2019, we had an international conference here in Brasilia, the Large Media and Impacts and Planetary Evolution 6. Four was in Fredofort, I told you before. Okay. And uh, that was when the evidence on Douglas was presented for the first time and I was quite happy with it. So let's see what happens with the second paper, and uh, then we can talk about Douglas. Okay, okay. Very, very interesting story. Ah, uh, yeah? <laughs> ok. Um, agora, uma pergunta para a Natália, por favor. Uhum. Passa para o. Doutor Uve, apesar que ele fala em português, tudo bem? Ele fala muito bem. É, eu estou vendo. <risos> Doutor Uve, é. Um... Querem saber se tem algum tipo de rocha alvo, the target rock, se tem algum tipo de rocha que seja é, melhor para a preservação das estruturas de impacto. 
Ele fala português, Natália. Todos, todos os critérios de impacto são diferentes. <risos> muito diferentes. Todos as áreas impactadas são Sim. diferentes em termos de, de, de composição das rochas, distribuição das rochas, um, depth, profundidade das crateras, um, quais rochas uh, temos na profundidade e na superfície, são diferentes. Ultimately, it depends on the projectile and the amount of energy that it can produce, which is principalmente velocidade. Which, which rocks are affected? E as efeitos nas rochas depende principalmente do, do pressão, da pressão e da temperatura no lugar desta rocha. Se o impacto tem força suficiente de gerar efeitos grandes, não é tão importante a natureza da rocha. Ok. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, for sure. Ok. Thank you, thank you. It's nice. So, uh, we, we have more just one question before we can finish because we have almost two hours of our chat. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, Dr. Uwe, why does Earth impact craters are circular and not oblique like those of Mars uh, or the Moon? Not all craters are circular. We have some Sadibari. cases. Sadibari is not circle. Well, Sadibari was deformed long time after the impact. There okay. was a mountain building episode going across the area of Sadibari, which okay. extended it northeast, southwest. But there is a structure in Australia called Mount Wilson, which is distinctly of ovoid shape, oh. elliptical. And that is probably the result of oblique impact. Impacts at angles below about 15 degrees from the vertical can be distinctly elliptical. And if they are not, only very detailed structural geological analysis can show whether they are properly or 100% circular or whether there is some kind of elongation in one direction. So there are quite a few structures for which oblique impact has been indicated in the Earth Impact Database now. Okay. Uh, and the, the last, the last, the very, the last question. The very last question. The very last question, for sure. Uh, Dr. Uvi, uh, some people want to know if you know the Eugenie uh, Shoemaker. I have known Gene Shoemaker. I have been you know? I have been privileged to know Gene Shoemaker for maybe 15 years or so before he very unfortunately died on geological field work in the Australian outback. Gene Shoemaker was a really great person, a formidable person, a fantastic geologist, somebody who took young scientists or those that were trying to become PhD students under his wings. He listened to them, he talked to them about their projects, and he always shared his experience. It was a privilege to meet him. Wonderful. This is the last question. <laughs> Do I get the last word, Paolo? What? Do I get the last word? No, no. <laughs> no, I want the last word. I want to thank you for the invitation. Oh, for this fantastic event. Yes, for me, is a, Dr. Uvi, for me, it's a great pleasure. Now I will speak Portuguese because I know that you speak Portuguese. 
É, doutor Uvi, para mim... Eu não posso não. <risos> Eu vou falar bem devagar. Mas, para mim, foi um grande é, momento do canal do Museu Jóias da Natureza. Eu entrevistei e já entrevistei várias pessoas maravilhosas, vários amigos, vários cientistas incríveis. É, tive o prazer de, de entrevistar o doutor Michael Zolensky, da NASA, que foi ma maravilhoso, o doutor Álvaro Crosta, o Douglas Galante, enfim, todos os amigos, eu só tenho que agradecer, mas eu estou muito, muito feliz é, com essa live de ter você, doutor Uwe Reimold, que para mim é, e para todo mundo da área é uma referência então, eu quero agradecer muito a sua gentileza, a, a, sua, a, a sua atenção é, e o seu carinho de estar com a gente aqui no canal do Museu Jóias da Natureza. É, a Natália, eu também quero lhe agradecer muito é, por você estar aí nos bastidores, é, nos bastidores dessa entrevista. Não, mas não. <risos> é, Ele fala português também, tudo bem. É. É, eu mas... to continue with my last word. Não, não, ok, ok. É, mas, assim, eu quero realmente é, é, agradecer a vocês. É, a Natália e o doutor Álvaro vão estar comigo na live do dia 19 sobre é, o domo e a cratera de Araguainha. E aí vamos ter vários amigos participando, enfim. Mas temos a Natália e o Álvaro falando sobre essa cratera incrível. O doutor Uvi está convidado para estar junto com a gente na live também, contribuindo <risos> com o seu português maravilhoso. É, doutor Uvi, é, eu já estou lhe fazendo o convite, não só você, mas a Natália, o Sim. Álvaro também. <risos> Quando o museu reabrir as suas portas, é, o setor da meteorítica, os meteoritos, os impactitos, é o setor que a gente mais tem um carinho de desenvolver. Eu faço questão que você venha conhecer e fazer um grande curso, um grande evento sobre é, crateras de impacto aqui no museu e mostrar a importância desse, dessa área da geologia. Tá bom? Obrigado. Muito obrigado. 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 I would like to thank Natalia for helping me. Não I would like to thank <risos> Natalia and Alvaro and Marcos and uh, other colleagues with whom we've been collaborating and with whom we are close friends. And all the people overseas that accompany me and now us for years on our impact cratering trip. But I do not want to forget the students. I mentioned them once before. The MSCs, the PhDs that have done all the work. And they Amazing. should really get the credit here at the end of this presentation too, because much of what I showed you, especially on Freire Ford, was done by them. So credit to them. Thank you very much, Paulo. It was great. Thank you very much, Luvi. Thank you very much, Natalia, for your support, you. for your kindness. For me, it's a great pleasure. It's a great honor. And I hope when this pandemic time is getting better, we can meet personal. And we can collect some impact rocks in Araguainha. That mm -hmm. is an amazing yeah. place. Yeah. Uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, keep, keep safe. And thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, eu gostaria de agradecer a todo mundo que também está na live nos assistindo. Muito obrigado pela participação de todos os amigos, de todos os alunos, estudantes. Uh, Para quem não pôde... É, acompanhar a nossa live, assista depois, que é uma aula sobre as crateras africanas, principalmente sobre o Fulida Forte, que é um espetáculo. É, eu quero agradecer também ao nosso parceiro, o Sérgio Pompeia, por estar com a gente, nos apoiando sempre. Muito obrigado a todos. Doutor Uvi, Natália, doutora, muito, muito obrigado. Uma boa noite, uma boa semana. E a gente se vê em breve. Um abraço obrigado. para todos. Obrigado, obrigado para todos. Obrigado, tchau. obrigado, querido. Tchau, tchau. Tchau, tchau. Obrigado. Boa noite, boa noite. Boa noite.